Good morning, everyone. My name is Brandon, and I'm one of the pastors here at Renaissance Church. If you would, I ain't hear no good mornings back. Hold on. Good morning, everybody. My name is Brandon. I'm a pastor here, and uh, I'm here to worship. I'm here to worship with you. There, there they go. I can't really see you. I didn't know if anyone was out there or not. If you would, if you're awake, would you flip to or scroll to Acts chapter one with me? And starting in verse 6, you'll see it says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, that is Jesus, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Today I want to talk to you about unity and diversity among God's people. I'm going to pray. Lord, we love you so much. What have we received, Lord God, that is not from you? Even the worship that we give to you this very morning, Lord God, is of you and from you. We give it back to you, God, in song, by looking at your word, by gathering with your people. We worship you, Lord God. We pray that the truth about Jesus Christ, our Lord, would grip our hearts in a, in a new position today, Father, and that we would see you more clearly, that we would love you above everything and that we would love other people like ourselves. Amen. You know, my family loves to barbecue. I'm just going to lay that out. We love barbecued food. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And, you know, I have a grill at our apartment here in Harlem, not, not too far from here. And we eat most of our barbecue, though, at my cousin Jimmy and Zida's house in Maywood, New Jersey. And they are like... Yo, pit master, like they can grill, grill. Like they are really, I hope I could get to their level one day. Like they are grill masters. Like if you didn't know any better, you would think they own like a barbecue joint in a city or, or in Jersey or somewhere. And, and so they grill very often and we go over there. It's a great time. All of our family goes, you know, we got very good food, as I mentioned, and water toys for the kids. Everybody's running around. They got a little more space than we do so they can do that type of thing. And and um, it's just a really fun time, you know what I'm saying? We break out the spades, right? And, um, you know, last time I was there just a couple weeks ago, I hopped on a spades table with my brother, one of my brothers and I. We, we played. We lost. They cheated. They did cheat. They did cheat. They did cheat. I'll tell you, that's it. You know, I'll t I can tell you about that later. They cheated, you know what I'm saying? But we, we lost. Well, while I was at the table, if I'm being honest, I'm not a big card game player. And so, like, I play spades maybe, like, once or twice a year. I'm not, like playing every weekend and thing, and because of that, I might forget the rules a little bit, like, wait, how does this game go again? And I'll be like, ooh, ah. Uh. And, and, and so I got to look up and say under the table and be like, oh, yeah, 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 okay, all right, I'm going to have to play. And, um, you know, my wife and I, we're from very different contexts. I'm a, from a context where we play spades, you know what I'm saying? And then her context, they actually play a very similar game called Rook. Has anybody ever heard of Rook? I see some head nods. Y'all y'all timid with it. They timid with it. They've heard of Rook asthma. And so uh, my, Malia, my wife, came over and was like, hey, you know, I, I would like to play uh, the winner of the next, but I got to admit she was more bold than me, more honest than me. Like, I'm, I've played, but I, I, I need a quick, quick refresher. Like, and, and to give her that, I thought of this and that. Like, yo, actually you do know how to play. It's just like this game you grew up playing called Rook. And in that moment, she was like, oh, yeah, that's right. I, I do remember the rules now. And we understood each other perfectly, right? And believe it or not, at that magical moment, all of the world's issues with unity and diversity evaporated into the barbecue smoke <laughs> along with that sentence. Uh, obviously, I'm joking, but, you know, a conversation like this can be really tough for many reasons. It, it can be really confusing. It, it can be a struggle. And, and I want us to know at the end of today that... Um, that, that we can see the heart of God in this topic very clearly. And I also want us to know that we are not alone in this whole journey. 
where we're not just left to fend for ourselves in this mess, right? We, 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 we walk down the block and we see old Harlem converging with, with new Harlem and all of its beautiful, rich history and all of its messy gentrification. And we know that we're not alone. And my hope is that by the end we would see that, that we, can, we can understand each other perfectly in Jesus. But if I'm keeping it all the way real with you, if we rewrote the values of our church today, we probably wouldn't use the word diversity just because of how polarizing it has become. Right? When, when I say unity, I, I don't mean it like, like a Fortune 100 company with an 800-person office in Midtown. We use it to say something like, you know, uh, whiteness is really the hidden center of what we're doing here. And, and, you know, we can remain integrated to the extent that we're first a comfortable place for the majority, for first a comfortable place for white people to be. Um, that, that's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying when I say unity and diversity is at minimum where equity and belonging exist. Equity and belonging Equity meaning equal standing in God's kingdom and, and belonging, meaning not, not just meaning that you're an afterthought, not just meaning that, that you're tolerated or you're allowed to have a seat at the table, you're allowed to be around, but that genuinely that you, in Jesus Christ, you can experience true, full belonging among God's people. And as nice as that sounds, <laughs> it's still a really, uh, uh, it's a topic of struggle for many reasons at least three of which I, I can talk about today. It can be a struggle because of pain. It can be a struggle because of privilege. And then it can also be a struggle because of proportion. Pain, privilege, and proportion. First, pain. Can we just talk about it? Like it it's a real thing that this conversation, when you talk about unity in, in, a, in a neighborhood like this, that was once 77% black in 2000 and 2019 was 54%. Things have, have changed in this neighborhood that would cause real pain for people. Maybe you or, or, or your cousin or your mom or your grandmother or all of the above have been pushed out of their apartments off 8th Avenue because the rent has raised dramatically every single year. You can no longer afford to live on what is now called Restaurant Row, but what used to be Vacant gravel lots with barbed wire fences. Or just development lies from the city. <laughs> Maybe you were promised that you'd be able to own the apartment that you're still renting now at 75 years old even though you don't want to be. Because the city told you you could buy it. They moved you out, they moved you back in, touched some stuff up, and then actually just decided to sell it to a multi-billion dollar real estate investor with a huge portfolio in the city. And here you are stuck. It's painful. It's real. And that makes it difficult to have this type of conversation because of real things that people experience. Or, or maybe, maybe that's not you. Maybe privilege. Maybe, maybe you're tired of hearing about uh, how whiteness has been the center of American Christianity for so long. Or maybe you're just hearing about that for the first time and maybe walking into Renaissance Church and maybe having to Google some of the references we make sometimes is that's tough, and, that, and those things can make it difficult to have this type of conversation. And those things also can lead to a lack of proportion. They can lead to a lack of proportion. You know, these realities make it difficult to see our share in the kingdom of God as equal to others in Christ. Our reactions to pain, our reactions to privilege might lead us inward. And in looking inward, we would find a lack of proportion. What do I mean by proportion, right? Like my kids, they, they're snack gremlins. That's what I call them. They love snacks. They, if you put snacks in front of them, they're gone immediately. And, but one thing my very smart wife has found out is that, like, they actually like certain healthy snacks. And so, like, they hate cooked vegetables, most cooked vegetables. But if you take that same vegetable and you don't cook it, you just rinse it and cut it up, they'll eat it. And one of those things is peppers. They love bell peppers. So they will eat like a, a, a bell pepper. You just slice it up and rinse it, and that's it. And um, oftentimes we use it to add and like pad the meal. So like last night we just kind of threw together some. We were all tired and uh, spent. And then I, I went into the fridge, rinsed the pepper, cut it up. I put it in a bowl. 
I'm bringing it to our dinner table. And imme- I mean, bef- I can barely g- grab my hand away from the bowl. They're just like grabbing all the, I'm like, geez. And so much so to where when I walk around on my side of the table, there's supposed to be proportion, right? Like four people are supposed to share this bowl of peppers. But when I get to my seat, the peppers are gone. And what happens there, right? Like we are prone to consider ourselves most and ourselves first. And a lack of proportion considering ourselves first is why the disciples asked Jesus this question in verse 6 when they said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? (laughs) Geographic Israel. They were concerned only with their people. And, and their people happened to be ethnic, geographic Israel. But, but I ask you, who's your Israel? Who, who would you have inserted into to that question there if you were standing in front of Jesus that day? Who do you call your people? I think it's an important question for us to answer this very day. Especially because the answer that Jesus gives them is an interesting one. He goes on in verse 8. Well, first in verse 7, actually, he says, like, mind your business. Like, first off, you don't even really need to be thinking about this is not for you to know. Amen. But but, but in verse 8, then he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Yes, Israel, but also not Israel. Yes, your people but also not your people. The answer Jesus gives to their question, he he doesn't just say no. He he leaves room for hope in a greater reality than what they were expecting. A hope that was more broad and, and more grand than what they wanted in the moment. Is God restoring the kingdom to Israel? Well, if by Israel you mean God's special people throughout all tribes, and all times, then yeah, sure. But if by Israel you just mean your special people, your favorite people, it's just not that narrow. You know, they're essentially asking Jesus, are, are you for us or for others? And Jesus says, yes. <laughs> are you for us or for them, Jesus? I need to know right now. Jesus says, yes, I am for all of those people. And Jesus answers with a wider view of God's kingdom that is just for a beautiful, unified, diverse group of people, not just this narrow, Jesus, are you for my people? Jesus, are are you for the people that I think get it right on the important stuff? And this is a theme throughout the whole book of Acts. You look to the very next chapter, it happens again. Acts 2, verses 6 through 11 say, And at this sound, the multitude came together. There's a lot of gathering, it seems like. But they they came together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors of Rome, both Jews and proselytes, so non-Jews, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty work of God. Here we see this miracle making it immediately obvious that the people of God is a decentralized people, that that making it obvious that the people of God is a people from all these different countries named. And if you think about it, this is why the question they ask in Acts 1-6 is not a good one. Abraham himself wasn't from Israel. Who Who they would have seen as their father in the faith, who we see, Christianity and Judaism, Abraham is the father of of those religions, as some would call it. And he was from Ur, which would have been Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq, not Israel. An African theologian named Lamin Sene once said it something like this. If you think about it, Christianity is the only religion where there is no center. 
Wherever the other major world religions began, that is still their center today. You think about it, Islam started in Arabia at Mecca. And the Middle East is still the center of Islam today. Buddhism started in the Far East, and that's still the center of Buddhism today. Same thing with Hinduism. It's, it's, it began in uh, India, and it is still an Indian religion. Christianity is the only exception. You can't pinpoint like one specific place that is like, oh, that's the Mecca of Christianity. That's the, the center of Christianity, no matter how much we might want that. There is no center it started in Israel, then it moved to North Africa, and then Europe, and then America. And now, if you look at it, it's actually now in South America and Africa, depending on the day. There is no center. It's always moving. And you know why that is? It's because in every language and in every culture, the gospel is the best hope. <laughs> it's hope for everyone on this planet. And it's a real hope that I don't want us to just restrict to our people. You see, the book of Acts is offering us a vision of community that no one person, no one group, no one club, no one city, no one state, no one country, no one ethnicity, no one uh, educational background, no one tradition can fulfill on its own. It's larger than that. Instead, God is calling us to be a uniquely unified community, which at least means we are a community where equity and belonging happen. You know, we don't have to love our skin or our frat any less. But if we love God more, then we must pursue equity and belonging in community. That is equity, equal treatment in God's kingdom. You can flip to Acts chapter 6. And I'll read verses 1 through 7. And it goes like this. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, that is Greek Jewish Christians, arose against the Hebrews, that is Hebrew speaking Jewish Christians, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parnamus, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. It's clear that this was an ethnic dispute because, again, the, the, the Greek Jewish Christians and the Hebrew-speaking Jewish Christians, which would have meant they were from different places, were in a dispute. There was a habit of disadvantaging a specific ethnic group within the church that had perpetual effects down to the Greek widows being neglected in ministry. And what was the solution? They appointed Greek leaders who would serve them and make sure that they weren't neglected anymore. And how do I know that they were Greek? I mean, read these names, like Philip, Nicanor, Timon. Like, it just, you just want to slap Antetokounmpo on the end. Timon, Antetokounmpo, Par Par Parmenas. Like, it's very, very Greek, those names. And they appointed them in particular to shift the power dynamics so as to make sure that all people were cared for. But why is that important? for a few reasons. One, the church got better. The church was able to administer care for all kinds of people, and that in and of itself put the very glory of Jesus on display, so much so that even priests started to convert to faith in Jesus because of how well the church was able to care for all of the people who came to them. You know, being in biblical community is kind of like proofreading, right? Like the church was proofread here when they had this conflict and they didn't run from it. They wrestled in it and they actually were able to then care for people better. 
And you think about like proofreading an idea or a paper or something like that. Like you might think you have a good idea until you run it by your friend who will keep it real with you. And they'll be like, ah, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's not a bad idea. I just, I, I maybe wouldn't do it that way. But <laughs> or like I, I sent one of my papers in seminary actually to my sister, uh, Jasmine, who is way smarter than me. She's a professor. And, yeah, so she's just way smarter than me. Has a different background than I do. And it, but I think it's funny, a side note, too, that I even call her my sister. She's technically my first cousin, but it would be disrespectful if you called her my cousin because she's my sister. Like, we're that close. When I think about it, like, I feel like, in my experience, most non-black people don't do that. They don't have, like, play. <laughs> they don't have play cousins and play. And I'm, like, I'm always confused by that. Like, you don't have, like, a friend that's been your friend since sixth grade, but, like, they're your cousin. That's not to... And people be like, nah, like we don't, they're just my friends in sixth grade. <laughs> um, and I'm like, all right, in, in, my, in my world, that means they're my cousin. Um, amen, thank you. But, uh, but my sister, my sister, Jasmine, she's a professor, and I shared with her one of my papers. And I'm a little self-conscious because, again, she, she's more sharp than me. And so I shared a paper that I actually was already prepared to, to, to turn in. Like I was like, this is good, but if you want to throw your little professor magic on it or whatever you go ahead and do that you knock yourself out thank you for your help but the red marks that came back on this paper y'all <laughs> shifting whole paragraphs like hey you use this word like 27 times and really I would just erase it from your vocabulary and writing as a whole <laughs> as a whole just like just like for future reference and like I took all of her advice and I wound up getting an A in the class amen yeah. all right yeah yeah, yeah. um Thank you, Jasmine, because I definitely would not. <laughs> I definitely would not. But yeah, I wound up doing really well in that class, and it, it was partly, large in part, because I had shared with someone who had different background and experience than I did. When we are in biblical community, which partly means that you're around people who are not exactly like you, <laughs> that are not exactly like you, you will inevitably be challenged in your thinking in a helpful way that you cannot in a community of clones and the community of monolithicity. You can clap. And the same goes for ideas. And this aids in equity. Being able to learn from and empathize with others is the groundwork of equal treatment, y'all. And equal treatment, giving everyone their due, is central to the very heart of God and the Bible. So in an equitable community, not only do you get better, you better portray the very God you claim to worship. You portray the very heart of Jesus Christ in Acts 1.8. And when you've created an equitable environment, you have a place where all people belong. Belonging, again, as God's children and as God's children alone, we all belong together in God's family. Not just being tolerated, not just allowed to be around and, and allowed to see and peer into the window. No, that genuinely in Jesus Christ we all have the right to be called children of God, John 1.12. And this is the last passage I'll show you in Acts, I promise. When I did it again, I didn't pull up a mark, so I'm going to buffer while I flip um, and fill the air. But, you know, Acts, it began with, um, it began with a isolating, mono-ethnic question, and it ends with a unifying multi-ethnic reality, 28, starting in verse 28. Therefore, let it be known, this is Paul speaking, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, and without hindrance. Therefore, let it be known that it's been sent to the Gentiles and they'll listen. And this room is proving that true. We are Gentiles. Gentiles are non-Jews in the biblical context. And I only know like five to ten people max that attend Renaissance Church that are Jewish by tradition. And so all the, all the rest of us are proven, verse 28, true. We are here listening to the very good news of Jesus. And, and Paul says here, too, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy for him. He lived there at his own expense. He persevered there, but he did so so that he could make it obvious that the people of God are not just for your people, just for your 
Israel, but that he would welcome all who came to him, persevering so that he could do that. Acts 1-6 begins with a question about our people, and then the whole book ends with the reality about all of God's people. You know, there's a basketball team that was called the New York Renaissance, not where we got our name. And they were the first black, all-black professional basketball team to be recognized, and it was owned by a man named Robert Douglas. And they were really good for many years, but they weren't allowed to play in white gymnasiums and white gyms and stuff like that. And that was unfortunate. And that was a problem because over the course of time, people started to wonder, like, this team is really, really good. Like, are they the best team in the world? We don't know because they're not allowed to play on the world stage. Until 1938, they earned an invitation to the professional world basketball tournament in Chicago, Illinois. And lo and behold, they won the joint. They won the whole chip. And from that point on, the NBA has become more and more integrated. Ten years after that, the first three African-American players were drafted into the National Basketball Association. And if you watch any games now, you got people from Greece and Latvia and Israel and France and Australia and Nigeria and South America and China and Japan, Brazil, Jamaica, Dominican Republic, from everywhere. And all of those people coming together constantly change the game to make it better. Now there's a three-point line. There used to not be that because people learned how to shoot from far. Again, people coming together with different skills. Now you can dunk. You, you couldn't always dunk in the NBA. It actually used to be a penalty. You couldn't do that. But people playing differently, coming together, have made the game better. And, 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 and they, it's a more entertaining league because of that. And when we become a place of true equity and belonging, we truly flourish too. And we also fulfill our purposes at a greater level. And we also show the very heart of God and the very person and character of God as well. Again, we saw in Acts 6, this was evangelistic. It, it displayed the glory of God for others to see and begin to worship him as well. And we do the same when, when we are unified. And I'll just bring you back to Acts 1.8 one last time when Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. Because in his answer to their isolating question, he gives them the whole person of God. (laughs) We know God to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three distinct persons of the same essence, Three unique beings, but one God, unified in a diverse community for the same purpose, with the same power, displayed here in this very verse. The whole person of God is represented here. God as a unified, diverse community. And so to say that you want to be with God is to say that you want to be in diverse community, and to then be in such a community today is to put that very God on display. Would it be so of us? Lord, we love you, and we cannot praise your marvelous name enough. You are holy, God, (laughs) and you are good, you and you alone. You are matchless. There is none like you. God, would you search our hearts that you would know us, Lord God, that that we may see the depravity of our hearts, Lord God, yet knowing that you love us anyway. And would the receiving of that great power and that great grace and our great, that great mercy drive us to love you above every other thing and to love other people like we love ourselves. In Jesus' name.